So there is a bubble coming. As Warren Buffett says, when the tide goes out, you see who's naked. But this is a different tide. This is not a credit tide. This is a tide of a mistake. Once again, the finance industry is ripe with people making once in a decade move that will make them billionaires. Investing a few thousand dollars risk is low, whereas return potential is a hundred times. For example, Michael Berry's Stan Asset Management made a 53 times bet with their 150 million to return potential of $8 billion. Now, if you're thinking Michael Berry just got lucky and his trade was a rare event, well, then you must know that Michael Berry was not the only person who predicted the 2008-2009 housing collapse and its impact on the financial system. Eastman, who was portrayed by Steve Carroll in the movie The Big Short, also made a fortune by betting against the banking sector. Recently, Eastman appeared on CNBC and shared his alarming perspective on the current financial crisis. Eastman suggests a lot of people are comparing the present banking crisis to the crisis that happened in 2008. However, despite both crises taking place within the financial sector, the situations are actually quite different. The recent failures of Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, and Credit Suisse have nothing to do with the quality of their credit. These banks are not failing because they mistakenly believe they had billions of dollars worth of assets that are now worthless. Rather, the types of assets they chose to invest in are the cause of their failures. Some of the regional banks, especially those that have a lot of deposits above 250 but long-term bonds at very low levels and have massive mark-to-market losses. That's why Silicon Valley failed. Also, they failed because they had a very concentrated type of deposit base, which has a very big hard mentality. Silicon Valley Bank made the decision to invest a significant portion of its deposits into long-term treasury bonds when interest rates were very low. This is generally a sound investment strategy, except in situations where there's a rapid increase in interest rates, which is exactly what happened over the previous 12 months. Suddenly, these U.S. Treasury bonds needed to be sold well before maturity at a steep discount. So, with the recent exposure of interest rate issues, it is possible that the problems faced by regional banks could affect major national banks like Bank of America or J.P. Morgan. However, Steve Eastman believes that the large U.S. banks are not in the same position as some of the regional banks. So, the risk of bigger banks failing is relatively small. However, it is possible that there could be more challenges going forward in the financial sector before the situation becomes stable. The large U.S. banks are better capitalized and have less risk than they ever had in anyone's lifetime. The European banks, while they're not as well capitalized, they're certainly better capitalized. That isn't to say there won't be pain if Credit Suisse goes down, but it's not in a wait as we enter the second week of banking collapse. Attention is turned to Credit Suisse, that is a global investment bank based in Switzerland, with over $1.5 trillion of assets under management. The bank is still struggling for some time and it is not fully recovered from the global financial crisis of 15 years ago. Over the past 12 months credit, Suisse's stock has declined by over 70%. If you hear that the company goes bankrupt, there will be losses. It's not death-defying losses, but it'll be a problem. It's just not it's not going to take down the system. It is often observed that larger banks are more likely to receive a government bailout in case of a failure. This is due to the fact that the government must balance the expenses of saving the bank against the possibility of consumer confidence being lost in the entire banking system, which would have far more dire consequences than a single bank failing. However, there may be a scenario where Credit Suisse is deemed too big to save in 2008 when everybody was trying to get bailed out. You know, if you looked at the US, the size of US GDP was many multiples bigger than all the bank balance sheets combined. Now, given the current situation, where does Eastman see the investment opportunities? Let's say the government doesn't bail anybody out. So clearly JP Morgan and Bank of America benefit, and it turned out even though they did get billed out. JP Morgan and Bank of America benefited. So our first thought was, well, maybe we should buy JP Morgan and Bank of America. The current banking crisis is primarily caused by interest rate risks rather than issues with credit quality. As a result, different types of banks are being affected in different ways. Smaller regional banks with a large amount of uninsured deposits are at risk of customers panicking and withdrawing their money despite the FDIC stepping in and fully covering all deposits of banks, such as SVB and Signature Bank. 
It is still possible for customers whose funds are not insured to panic and want to withdraw their money from these regional banks. And on the other side, major state banks such as Bank of America have a higher percentage of their deposits covered by FDIC insurance. This makes a bank run at these banks less likely. So not only are these big banks not facing the same issues as regional banks, rather, they're actually benefiting from customers moving their money out of regional banks with higher uninsured deposits into larger banks with higher insured deposits. Deposits. So why be a hero? Because you have absolutely no idea what's going to happen. The best you can say is, you don't know. And if you don't know, you shouldn't play in light of his analysis of the banking industry. Eastman is determined against investing in banks because he lacks the knowledge necessary to predict their future profitability. And because there are thousands of publicly traded businesses, and you don't need to have an opinion on each one. This is a crucial idea to comprehend when investing. In fact, you only need to have an opinion on a handful of companies to do well over time. In Warren Buffett's latest shareholder letter, he shared that almost all of his investment success came from about 12 investment decisions, which is an average of just one great decision every five years. So it's important to always look for unique investment opportunities in the market. But if something does not make sense to you, then it's best to avoid it. We are moving from one paradigm to another paradigm. So the paradigm of the last several years has been rated very low. You're paid to take risk, and you're actually paid to take a lot of risk. If rates stay up, Eastman believes that the high growth tech company's performance in the stock market is unlikely to return to its previous levels anytime soon. In the period of 2010 to 2020, when interest rates were extremely low, investors were compensated for taking on additional risk. However, with interest rates now approaching historical averages in 2023, it has become much more difficult for unprofitable companies to operate. As a result, returns in the stock market have shifted away from speculative tech companies and towards other areas of the capital markets. Although, over time, you'll be able to buy some treasuries and buy some bonds. Cash is now offering a substantial return for investors, making it a viable option for storing capital. As a result, a sizable sum of money has been taken out of the stock market. Since a long time ago, the stock market has not experienced this degree of volatility from 2010 to 2020, when cash and other safe investments offered low returns. Because even in uncertain economic conditions, money tended to remain in the stock market, resulting in less volatility. Currently outside of the stock market, investors can secure a return of around 4%. This means that any fear or uncertainty can cause significant swings in stock prices. While this may be concerning for emotional investors, it can be beneficial for value investors who want to purchase great companies when their stock prices are unreasonably low. In fact, volatility is exactly what value investors look for. Interestingly, there are also some businesses that Eastman is betting against or short selling due to the rising interest rate environment we are currently in. The way these things unfold takes a long time. It really depends on each company when their debt rolls over. If somebody bought that building two years ago with long-term debt at 3%, let's say it's five-year paper, and in five years, it's going to roll over. And it's going to be 7%. That's not good. Eastman is also discussing the current situation in the residential real estate market. In Australia, many mortgages are presently moving from having a 2% interest rate to having a 7% interest rate. However, this change is occurring abruptly right now rather than gradually. Over the following five years, this serves as a reminder that we may not have yet fully experienced the impacts of rising interest rates, and because of the delayed effect of these rises, there might be adverse effects in the following year or so. The Federal Reserve in the United States is facing a challenging task of balancing the fight against inflation without damaging the economy. Financial conditions have really tightened, but you still have inflation. It's not clear if either move is good or not. Thanks for watching. Until the next one.